Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about hydrostatic weighing or underwater weighing. Uh, the purpose of underwater weighing is to get the most accurate measure, what's con considered to be the most accurate measure of body composition that we can get. Keep in mind that we learned earlier this semester that uh, body composition refers just to the ratio or percentage of fat-free mass to fat mass. Um, you can take body composition down to further uh, subcategories, but for today we're just going to keep into the what's called two compartment model. So fat-free mass or lean body mass, which is made up of the water, minerals, bones, and muscles. Pretty much everything that's not fat versus the fat mass. Uh, now fat mass can be uh, subcategorized down to essential fat and storage fat. But again, this method of analysis is only going to be able to tell us fat mass versus fat-free mass or lean mass. Uh, keep in mind your normative values. Uh, so for males, they need at least 3% of their body weight to be fat mass for just uh, normal physiological function. For females, that's around 10 to 12%. Uh, so on average, normal or uh, normal weight individuals, males will have around 15% body fat, plus or minus 5, and females will be around 21, plus or minus 5%. Our obesity cutoffs are always two standard deviations above, so for males that would be 25%, females that would be 31%. Um, there's more detailed uh, categories near the end of this whole entire lab assignment that we'll be going over to use for classifications, but those are just the typical guidelines. So, with hydrostatic weighing, we are looking at trying to estimate density. Uh, density, if you go down to its root formula, is uh, m over v, or mass divided by volume. Now, density, uh, once we figure that out, we can uh, determine composition based off of that. And mass is very easy to find. Um, we just weigh the subject. We've done that multiple times in the lab already, and you can do it at home even. It's very easy. The volume can be a little difficult to find. That's where hydrostatic weighing actually comes into play. So the theory of hydrostatic weighing is based on Archimedes' principle, which states that when a body is immersed in water, it will be buoyed or, uh, by a counterforce equal to the weight of the water displaced, meaning that whenever we take something and put it into water, that the water that it is displacing is pushing up against it or trying to lift it up which causes some items to float. So sometimes that displacement force is equal or strong enough that it will actually cause the item to float. And that deals directly with the density. Now this link here um, is a very insightful YouTube video where they go into the details of Archimedes' principle, um, the thoughts and actions that it works with. But basically what you need to know is if we can determine the amount of water we're displacing, that is the overall volume of water, and that volume is equal to the volume of the body, or in this case, the human body that we're trying to estimate composition. Thus, we can find volume and then try to figure out density. Now, we are working on a few assumptions here. We're assuming that water has a exact density of one gram over centimeters cubed. Uh, we know for scientific fact that it's not always the case and that temperature will affect it, and we'll talk later on how to account for that. We also assume that fat-free mass, so everything that's not fat, has an average density of 1.1 grams per centimeter cubed. And that fat tissue, so just adipose tissue, is 0.9 grams per centimeter cubed. So, given that information, I want you to go ahead and postulate and figure out in your own thoughts what would sink and what would float, just knowing these average densities. Hopefully, uh, if you take a moment, you'll realize that fat tissue, since it is less dense, would actually be the object floating because it is less dense on average than water. And that fat-free tissue, so everything that's not, would actually sink. So in this case, the blue uh, bowling ball would represent the fat tissue, and the white or cream-colored bowling ball would represent the fat-free mass. So with underwater weighing, we are, again, looking to estimate density. We take someone's mass outside and then we weigh them uh, under the water to help determine their volume. Now, underwater weighing tanks can be set up in a myriad of different ways. 
Um, these are just four different examples. So these three here are someone actually sitting um, and on a scale while this one is actually laying down. They all still work the same. You basically have a large scale that um, you could find at your grocery store to weigh fruit. In this case, it's large enough to actually just weigh an individual while they're underwater, keeping in mind that uh, when you're underwater, you really don't weigh as much. So uh, the procedures for hydrostatic weighing uh, go the same regardless of your setup. First, you have to make sure you get the individual's weight as well as anything else that's going in their tank. In this case, it would be the weight of the swimsuit and the weight of the harness or the weight belt. Um, we'll discuss the purpose of the weight belt here in just a little bit, but in some, it's mainly just to hold the subject underwater because we don't want to assume that their body composition will keep them underwater enough to take an accurate weight. So record their height and their weight. Uh, the height really doesn't play a terrible amount into the density equation, but we're going to use it later on to figure out residual volume, uh, which we've already talked about this sem semester with the pulmonary function testing. Once you get all those uh, dry weights or weights in air, uh, you have the subject enter, them, the, enter the tank and go ahead and submerge themselves underwater to wipe off any bubbles on their swimsuit. Um, the same thing goes for their arms and their legs and you have them go ahead and soak their hair. Uh, now, I know it may seem silly, but those tiny little bubbles all over your arms and legs and any air caught in your swimsuit will throw off the weight. Um, even throwing off the weight by uh, as little as 0.1 or 0.2 kilograms uh, can make a big difference in overall composition measurements. So we need to account for that. Now, once we get rid of uh, as many air bubbles as we can, we'd have them set on the chair that the uh, scale is actually attached to, um, prep them for what they are about to do and explain the rules and procedures. So basically what we're gonna have them do is take a breath, lower themselves under the water, and while they're lowering themselves under the water, we'd have them blow out all the air that they possibly can. When they get fully underwater, we have them keep blowing air out uh, until they can't pretty much um, and then we have them hang out for one to two seconds and then come up whenever they can't stay under any longer now that all sounds terrible and it sounds like we're pretty much drowning the individual but I promise that we're not and uh, it's actually a very comfortable relaxed setting um, the water is usually around 35 degrees Celsius which is around 40 or 94 to 96 degrees Fahrenheit so it's warm it's comfortable um, the water is not deep you can always stand up as soon as you feel uh, if you ever feel in distressed but um, it sounds a lot worse than it is but we're trying to really get all the air out that we possibly can so we don't affect the measure uh, if you've ever been swimming in a tank before, one of the easier ways to go down towards the bottom is to let out all of the air. It's the same principle in a submarine when they're trying to dive. They blow bubbles or actually just let out all or a good chunk of air to help the submarine sink. And we don't want that air trapped inside to affect our overall weight. So once they come back up, or, or once we get our weight underwater, they come back up, take a breath, reset, and then we go through the procedure again. Um, different labs have different rules and guidelines. For our lab, we try to take at least five measurements and no more than hopefully 10, because by then it should equal out to, or level out to a normal weight. Things to keep in mind, uh, even if you are able to blow out all the air that you possibly or comfortably feel like you can, um, there's still going to be some left over there. And as we learned with the pulmonary function testing, that is called residual volume. So that is the air that's left in the lungs after maximal exhalation. It's used to keep those lungs inflated uh, and to create a pressure gradient for breathing. So it helps us to actually breathe. Um, and you, to account for this, you can directly measure it, um, or we have these wonderful prediction equations that are actually fairly accurate based off of just gender, age, and someone's height. These equations are listed in your lab manual, and you will be using them for your assignment later on. So we will make sure that you have someone's age, someone's uh, sex or gender, and their height. And for this equation, make sure that the height is in inches. Okay, good. 
Uh, additionally, we want to consider everything that is not the individual, and that will be declared the tear weight, T-A-R-E weight. Okay. In this case, it would be the swimsuit that they're wearing, the chair that they're sitting on, and then the weight belt or the harness that we actually give them. Again, we are giving them this harness uh, not to make them feel like we're drowning them, but to make sure that we're actually picking up their true weight under the water. Uh, some individuals may have so much adiposity or adipose tissue or fat that they don't truly ever go under the water. So you may actually need to add more weight to the tear weight to hold the individual underwater so we can get an idea of how much they weigh. Now, once we take their weight underwater, we will have to account for this tear weight. So we always have to keep in mind how much weight we're adding um, because when we go through the equations to get a corrected water weight, we will be subtracting the tear weight off because the weight that we get while they're under the water is everything that's under the water. So in this case, it would be the individual, the swimsuit, the chair, and the weight belt. So we will have to subtract the swimsuit, chair, and weight belt to just get the weight of the individual. Okay. Uh, one more thing to consider is the actual temperature of the water. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the true density of water is not always one. It's extremely close to one, but based upon the temperature, uh, it will change. You have this chart as well, or this table as well on your lab manual, but basically we can see that as the water gets warmer, the density of the water actually decreases. Uh, not drastically, but it does. So it is actually a little bit easier to uh, float in colder water. Uh, so what we need you to do now, uh, since we are not able to physically perform the underwater weighing test with our current situations, is click on this link and go watch the video from Appalachian State University um, demonstrating their underwater weighing setup. Now I will say that theirs is a little bit more fancy than ours, uh, but it is a really good representation of a typical underwater weighing. Uh, once you get done with this, Go ahead and click the link for video two and we'll go over some practice data as well as go over your homework assignment.